thank you, Turia, for taking the time. And I'm really, congratulations on your new book. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's all very exciting. Well, you know what it's like when you finish a book and you then you got to do the, not got to, get to do the publicity for it and everything. Um, but I wonder, do you ever forget what you wrote in your books? Yeah, yeah. No, sometimes I do. Sometimes I open them up and go, oh, God, that's really good. Like, sometimes I see really good advice or sometimes I've cited research and I'm about to go somewhere and I'm like, oh, my God, that's such good research. I must share that. And it's something I actually have clearly learned and forgotten that I knew. I don't know. What about you? Yeah, no, I found that um, now that I'm starting to do the publicity for the book, I've had to go back and, like, read. <laughs> not, not reread it, but just, like, um, reassure myself of the things that I wrote in there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a brilliant writer. You're a great communicator. I mean, so... Yeah, thank you. Thank you're you. Good, you're good to read. I enjoy reading you. In fact, I take... When I... What your style is just so who you are, which I like to think I write that way myself, but I don't know that I always do so well at it. But um, it's a very readable book. Good, good. I like being told that I'm readable. That's <laughs> that, that was the aim. Like, I, I guess when you, when you, like, I know, you know, you, you write a lot of self-help books, but I guess when you're in that realm, um, I know that I can personally take it a little bit too seriously. And I think that's why it was important for me to have a bit of a sense of humour and yeah. be a little bit self-deprecating as well because I think um, I think sometimes we approach our life in a really serious manner yeah. when it can be just as good to take the pressure off ourselves and live a little bit, enjoy life and relish in the moment as well. Yeah, I agree. Actually, and it kind of, I mean, this ties in with part of the book as well and I think even that this time that we're living in and you and I were, we're chatting just, I've started recording now, just so you know. I'm going to dive in. But I think sense of humour really helps a lot with just dealing with life's twists and turns and tests and trials and all of that. And, and you've had a humour. I mean, since the first time I met you, you're just naturally, I think, a funny person. But I think that's incredibly helpful for resilience too and being able to just get through sometimes the tough times. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I mean, you know, you probably heard that saying, if you, if you don't know what else to do, you just have a laugh. Um, so I think it is really important to not take yourself too seriously um, and try and have a good sense of humour about the situations that you're in. But I don't think it is crucial. And I don't think that, you know, sometimes it's not our first reaction to have a laugh about something. I remember once I, um, I got nominated for this woman's award it was a new Oh, hang on. Hang on, Turia. Oh, sorry, Turia. Yeah. My wife, I just went funny then. Can we just start again? Can you just start saying from where we went, it went funny when I remember one time I got nominated for this woman's award. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I remember one, one time I got nominated for... Uh, a woman's award and on the invite it said it was at uh, Parliament House and so I booked flights, I booked accommodation in Canberra, we got into the taxi, I showed the taxi the address on the invite and he said oh we don't have this address down here in Canberra and I re-looked at the invite and it was in New South Wales, the very <laughs> state I had just travelled from. So when I made that big fuck up, did I laugh in that moment? No, I didn't. I was really annoyed at myself. I was dismayed. I was disheartened. But now, several years later, I'm able to use that story and share that story. Yep. And I can see the funny side in it. Yep. Um, I don't think you always have to be able to see the good in a situation straight away. I don't think you have to be able to see the humour in a situation straight away either. No, I get it. No, I've had plenty of times where I haven't. So in, in your new book, you're talking about being happy and, and can we actually really, is, is this even a realistic pursuit that we can be fully happy all the time? What do you think? I don't think, I think part of being human is accepting and this is part of happiness as well as accepting that we're not going to be happy at 
every single moment throughout our days and throughout our lives and, and accepting that that's okay, that it's okay and very natural and normal to, to be experiencing the whole spectrum of human emotion. Um, but I do think we can improve our happiness levels and that's why I wrote the book. So there's lots of things that we can do and that have been, um, you know, that's supported by research that can help us to be happier. And for example, yeah. one of those, how I started off the book is just by practicing gratitude. That's been a scientifically demonstrated way to improve our happiness. But I also think it, it's really in the, in the hands of the reader because Maybe for some people, practicing gratitude doesn't help them with their happiness, and that's okay. I just share these different strategies that I know work for me, and if they work for the reader, great. And if they don't work for the reader, then that's fine as well. Yeah. Yeah, obviously gratitude, it's a great tonic for when life's difficult. Part of it in you also wrote about is how do we find in hard times, and a lot of people right now are going through hard times, Financially hard times, you know, just obviously I'm from Melbourne and so a lot of people I know back in Melbourne are going through a hard time in the midst of a lockdown. Um, I'm not sure by the time this airs if they'll still be in that state, hopefully not. But when people are in the midst of hard times and or they've come out the other side of it, which you obviously have gone through a lot and how have, what have you found helpful when it comes to reframing it or finding purpose in it or using it in a way that allows us to ultimately live a happier life? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is just acknowledging your feelings. Um, I think, you know, we, we assume that we have to be able to find the light straight away. We assume we have to be able to just quickly reframe, shift our mindset. And I think, yeah, all of those things are great. We can get to those. But it's also equally good to just say hey this is really shit i hate lockdown um yeah i'm not really loving life right now or if you're under financial or emotional pressure or whatever just saying to yourself this is shit this is a really tough time mm -hmm. um i'm not enjoying it and i'm not really happy right now either and i think once you acknowledge and accept your feelings you don't deny them i think they dissipate a lot quicker as well so that would yeah. be my my advice, just just own your feelings, own how you're feeling. Yeah. If you feel like shit, then that's okay. That just means you are a human being. Yeah, I, I actually wrote about this recently for Forbes and, and I did another podcast on this, this concept of toxic positivity. Yeah. And we're in this culture that's like, be positive, it's all good, you know, don't worry, be happy. And actually that can ultimately make us more miserable. Yeah, for sure, because I think... Yeah, you're being, you're not being genuine with yourself and how you're feeling because if you're feeling sad and you try and bullshit your way through it, then you're not, you're not tuning in, you're not, you're not allowing yourself to feel whatever you're feeling. And I'm not saying it's, it's good to always be feeling down and miserable and sad and resentful, um, but it is okay to feel like that if you want to feel like that. Yeah. I know you, you are generally a pretty positive person and you have overcome some pretty extreme adversity in, where, in a pretty, I would call it a very powerful way. You know, you have not been defined by your experience of having burns to what, 65% of your body or is that right? Am I? Yeah. yeah. Um, and yet I'm sure you have your own days that are shitty and you've had, you know, whether it's recently or over the last, what, nine years since you had, you were in that, you were in that, 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 that fire. But how do you in general, when you find yourself feeling flat and down, I mean, you've just mentioned gratitude, but are there any kind of specific things that you have found incredibly helpful for helping you to just pull yourself back up and get back to being yeah. who you want to be? Yeah, and I mean, sometimes we have to do that stuff, don't we? Like if we're about to go in to pitch our big idea at a meeting, we can't go into that meeting feeling really sad and dejected and and um, apathetic, can we? We've got to bring our game, so to speak. So there's lots of different things, but the main thing I do to change how I'm feeling, and I've done it ever since I was a little kid, is just exercise. So I know that if I'm feeling like shit and I go for a run, I'll come back, I'll feel a lot better about myself and a lot better about the situation that I'm in. If I'm feeling crap and I go for a surf, I'll come out of the surf and I'll feel happier and calmer and 
I guess, more at peace with how I'm feeling. So I use exercise. I know there's a lot of different strategies out there that people use. I know some people do squats. Tony Robbins, who we saw together, yeah. Margie, he, he does squats. He does the power move things. I don't really do that type of thing. But I also love if I'm under, um, but I don't have a lot of time, I also like to have a cold shower. That's the Mim Hof thing you were talking about. <laughs> so that's the Mim Hof thing. Well, but it works. Like if you don't have an hour to go for a run and you're feeling like shit and you need to, if, and I need to go present or I need to go into a meeting or I need to go into an interview and I have to be on form, then I can have a cold shower and that's going to change how I feel. Yeah. That's cool. You know what? That's not one I have ever tried. Um, I kind of cringe at the thought of it, but um, I'm glad to hear you found it helpful. Maybe, maybe I'll try it. <laughs> but this is the thing. Like, this is the thing about the book. I'm, I'm, I'm not like I'm just sharing what I've learned along the way of learning about happiness, and I'm sharing what I've learned with the reader. And so it's up, it's up to the reader. Like, if they don't want to have a culture, that's so fine. There's yeah. a lot of different ways yeah. to get same result yeah you, you wrote also about which about self-talk which is something yeah. i i mean obviously you and i we did tony robbins unleash the power within together and um he gets into a lot of like what is it what's the story we're telling ourselves what is that what's that conversation going on in our own heads and often it's a negative one that makes us feel less powerful and less positive in our lives yeah but you you talked about pressing mute how on earth do you just press mute? Well, I guess it's it's not it's not so much pressing mute on that voice because there's going to be noise in your head, whether you, whether you like it or not. But I like to try to talk to myself how I would talk to my sons. So I would never say to my sons, "You're really slow at running. You're shit. You should just give up now." And I'm sure you wouldn't talk like that with your family either. And so as a mum, it's really easy for me if I'm being really mean to myself, which, you know, we can all do, we're, we're our own worst critics. I like to try and stop that and try and talk to myself how I would talk to my son. And I think practising self-compassion and self-love all falls underneath that self-talk umbrella. And I really think that's, that's part and parcel of, of improving our happiness, just being a little bit kinder, a little bit gentler and a little bit more compassionate with ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that concept of self-compassion. I interviewed a woman called Dr. Kristen Neff a few years ago and she wrote a book called Self-Compassion. And what she found was that people who practice self-compassion, when they've had a, a knockback, they are actually more resilient at picking themselves back up so we bounce back faster. But also in the face of failure, people who don't beat up on themselves for having, yeah. you know, like you went to the wrong state to go to an event. Like you, you, I'm sure you beat up on yourself for a little bit, but then the sooner we can step back and go, you know, I'm human. I'm really busy. I make mistakes. <laughs> then yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like, and, and just, and just, if you just own it as well and just be like, yeah, I fucked up. Yeah. I was busy. I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry. Like I think when we just own what we did, and accept that we're human, we've got flaws, we've got, we're not perfect, that's part of being human as well. Um, I think when we're brave enough to do that, it lets other people in our lives, it, it gives them, it doesn't give them bravery, but it, it, it allows them to do the same as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Another thing that you've, you've, I know you in the last few years, you've run a lot of programs helping people achieve their goals and you've, yeah. you've run two is it two ultra marathons that you have run? Um, so I've done two Ironman events. Two Ironman. Okay, sorry. All right, two Iron. Well, okay, only, 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 only two Ironmans. Um, and when it comes to goals, you're pretty. You seem to me to be a pretty goal focused person. Um, mm. That's my perception of you. Some people really struggle with just getting into action toward their goals, and and I and I know that. For us to thrive as humans, I really believe we have to be working toward things that are meaningful to us. You know, it's not the actual achievement of things as much as it's the working towards something that's meaningful. But when it comes to goals, how do you know whether it's a goal you should be pursuing or not? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the, if you're struggling, struggling to achieve or to reach your goals, um, a lot of the times we might 
tell ourselves that we're setting a goal and it might be something that we don't, we're not actually that interested in. You know, like people say to me, oh, I should start running. Just because they should do it doesn't mean it's actually something that they want to do, that they want to invest time and energy into and commit to and all of that stuff. And then they might feel bad because they haven't started running even though it wasn't something that they even actually want to do in the first place. So I think just, just check in with themselves and see if it's something that they, that they actually want to do, if, if it's something that they are actually interested in. Um, I think that's a really valuable starting point. And for a lot of people, the easiest place to start is to find a goal that aligns with stuff that you are interested in. So for me, it's pretty obvious that I'm a pretty physical person. I love, I love achieving um, physical goals like Ironman and like ultra marathons. So that's more of an easier goal for me to set if, I, if I'm struggling to achieve my goals. I hope that makes sense, my answer. Yeah, no, no, absolutely doesn't. Yeah. I think it, it, it just depends on who we are. I totally get that um, when it comes to picking the right ones. I think sometimes you say, oh, I want to be, I want to be skinny. Actually, we like the idea of it, but actually you're really, you're not that committed. To, you're not, you're not committed to give up what you need to give up. And really, do you really want to be skinny or do you just want to feel better about yourself? Exactly. <laughs> and which is, and case, do you have to wait to be skinny to do that? Yeah, and then like that's the thing we beat ourselves up for for not achieving things that we are not entirely committed to in the first place, and I think that's just crazy. Yeah, like I I really encourage the reader as well to to check in with themselves and ask themselves if it's if that goal is something that they that they even want, and I think a lot of a big part of the not the problem, but a big part of it is just the language we use around it because the word goal is not very exciting. It's not very sexy. When you say it to people, they go, oh, yeah, like, you know what I mean? So I like to call them champions because I think champions is a word that's funner. It's got more energy around it. And it's something that I would be more interested in doing as well. Yeah. So I think the language we use is, is really important. Yeah, that's interesting. Have you, in the last few years, have you failed at any goals you've set for yourself? Have I failed at any goals I've set for myself? Yeah, well, I guess there's been goals that I haven't achieved. So I guess, um, I guess that's failing. But I also think sometimes you don't know if you want to achieve a goal until you've started to do the work towards it. And I'm sure you found this as well in your experience. Like, yep. You know, you can think that you want to be a harp player. You can sign up for harp lessons. You can buy a harp. You can watch videos of people playing the harp. And then you could be six weeks in and say, I hate playing the harp. I never want to see another stringed instrument in my whole entire life. So I think quitting on a goal or just not seeing it through, I think that's fine as well because maybe it means that yeah. the goal in ourselves, it wasn't a good match up. Yeah, I think there's a lot to that, that idea of giving ourselves permission to quit and yeah, not, totally. sticking, not sticking with something just because you said you would do it. It's like, actually, I know I said I'd do it, but I don't want to do it anymore. And, and, give, and I think that's actually pretty brave to say, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, and just, I don't just say, I thought I'd like it. I spent three grand on this harp and I'm going to sell it on eBay. Like, yeah. Hey, you, didn't buy, I, you, didn't, you didn't buy a harp, did you? Me? No, why do you? <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, just, you were talking about the harp. I'm wondering if you actually happened to buy yourself a harp. <laughs> no, that was, that was purely for examples, examples, um, sake. I did buy myself some roller skates though, because I thought I wanted to, um, pick up roller skating. Yeah. Never used them. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, think, I, I've yeah, had I think, my fair share of that too. Sorry. Yeah. But I think it's like, that's, it's so fine. Like you can think that you want to do something, buy it, then change your mind. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And I think the more we are comfortable and the, and the braver we are, like, like you so put it, at just owning that we might have wanted to do it then and we don't want to do it now, or we've changed or we have flipped our opinion. The more we're comfortable with doing that and the braver we are, um, the easier it becomes for ourselves as well. Yeah. You've had two beautiful boys in the last few years. Yeah. How has having children shifted your perspectives or aspirations or what have, what is, what has shifted for you from that experience of having kids? Um, 
Well, look, since having my two boys, I haven't done any like crazy endurance events. I did the Kathmandu coast to coast mountain run, but that was like 30K. So it wasn't anything on, on the same level as an Ironman. And I always thought after I gave birth that I would go and do another big crazy endurance event. But then I just haven't felt compelled to. And I think, again, I, th I think that's okay. I think that's, like you said, my priorities have shifted. I want to be at home with my boys. I want to be spending time with my family. I don't want to be out on a Sunday riding a bike for eight hours. I just don't, I don't want to do that anymore. And I think that's okay. Like this is the time now. My boys are young um, to be spending time with them. And maybe when they're older, I'll, I'll get back into endurance events and maybe not as well. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, and who knows? Maybe they'll be out there on their bikes with you. Who, who doesn't yeah. know? But yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. Um, just in finishing up, you, I know you wrote about this in the book and it's something that I've written and talked about a lot too because I think it's so important and that is starting our day strong. And how do you start your day and how does it shift? And what, is, what do you advise for other people who may not have much of a morning? They kind of just get up and sort of saunter into their day with a cup of coffee. And, but how do you, what have you learned about starting your day strong and what's helpful? Okay, so I'm one of those people who start my day with a cup of coffee. Um, I, that, I guess that's part of my morning ritual. But the next thing I do or the next thing I don't do is I don't look at my phone. And this is, um, I found this really surprising when I was researching this book, the amount of people who pick up their phone and it's just, they're on autopilot. They're not really thinking about what they're doing. And the problem is once you pick up your phone, you're suddenly sucked into this digital vortex of all of the emails that you've missed, messages, calendar, calendar requests, and that, that sacred time in the morning which is just for you, is suddenly taken up by you thinking about what everyone else needs from you in order to make their day better. Yep. So I like to start my day thinking about what it is that I want. And before I had kids, that would be writing, doing creative work, going for a run. And now that I've got kids, they're up really, really early. So those couple of hours in the morning is time for just my family and I where we are hanging out, playing on the carpet, um, and I'm drinking my coffee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I have to say, when I had little kids too, the mornings were not my own and now they are my own again because when you get bigger kids, they don't want to get up until way after you want to get up. Um, it will happen one day, but it, it just changes everything for the day. It totally sets me up. And, and, and finishing up, I want to just, for anyone that's listening right now that has been inspired by you in overcoming and just the attitude you've brought to your challenges, and as people are feeling challenged with their own challenges, what is your one, what would be one main piece of advice for someone and something that they can do right now today after listening to our conversation that you think would just help them to feel more positive and happier about themselves and their future? Yeah, I think one thing would be to accept and acknowledge how they're feeling. So if they feel like shit, that's okay, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly valid human emotion. And the second thing I would want them to do is in the morning, I would want them to ask themselves what would make today great. And whether that something great is calling a friend, getting a coffee, writing for 15 minutes in your journal, doing a gratitude practice, um, reading a chapter from the book that you're reading at, at the moment, whatever it is, I want them to go and do it and then see how they're feeling at the end of the day because I'm pretty sure that it would make them feel a whole lot better about themselves. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic advice. What's one, one thing that you can do? And if every day we do one thing, it's going to be a better day than if we didn't. So, well, look, Turia, thank you so much for your time and your insights and being the inspiring woman that you are and uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to see you now thriving in motherhood and what a blessing. Yeah, thank you so much. So good to catch up with you. Uh, my pleasure. All right, take care. Bye.